<laughs> Hi, folks. So my name is Mishka Viscardi. I use they, them pronouns. Um, and it was a, um, it, it struck me a couple times in the past few years that I've become more an, of an active member in this community that um, I wasn't hearing a lot of conversations about queer inclusivity in our community. Um, and when I first entered this community, um, I was also struck by the fact that there wasn't a lot of conversation at the time happening on decolonization of nature-based work. Um, and now that's happening. And, um, and we've been having a lot of more active conversations about it, um, but are still lacking a conversation on this topic and how it relates to decolonization work and how it relates to nature-based work. Um, I want to give Lily a chance to introduce themselves also and expand a little bit on that. Thanks. I'm Lily Sage. I use she or they pronouns. Pleasure to make y'all's digital acquaintance in the case that we haven't met in person before. Um, similarly, um, I was struck at the time that I started working first at, um, at a wilderness school also based in Connecticut and then um, attending Art of Mentoring and, uh, and the Nature Connection mm -hmm. Conference uh, that while the decolonization conversation or decolonialism conversation was beginning to take place, thank you Saskia and David in particular um, for bringing that to the fore, that, uh, that queerness and uh, the way that queerness specifically has been erased and other genders have been erased, um, we think in large part to colonialism that uh that that wasn't included in the conversation so we're really excited to bring it up with y'all and um and be able to dialogue around it um and we wanted to open with a quote that comes from queer i don't know if folks are familiar with queer nature you can raise your hand if you've heard of them okay so a fair amount of folks uh queer nature is <clears throat> It does similar work to, I imagine, the kind of work that most of us do, um, but has a specific decolonial and queer focus, and it's mostly for adults or young adults. Um, and it is run by an two, two different people, an indigenous person and their partner. Um, and they do most of their programming out west, but they have done a lot of nice theorizing that I think fits in well with what we're doing uh, or what we're hoping to talk about today. So I'm gonna share a quote first from them. Um, that is, there are many mysterious and beautiful ways in which nature reflects queerness. And we kind of wanted to open with that and uh, ask, pose the question, what representations of queerness are you aware of in the natural world? So we can just like start opening a little bit conversation if anyone wants to jump in now at any moment. Um, we're just looking for examples of uh, plants, animals, fungi that you're aware of who have um, either uh, I could help me with the lingo. Have have varying gender <laughs> expressions or uh, express reproductive behaviors uh, with the same sex. Yes. So some uh, an example um, that I have just to start uh, are oysters. Oysters are um, all born male, and at various stages of life some of them decide to be female and their organs change um, and they get new abilities 
And this is just a naturally occurring thing. So any examples like that, we're just kind of trying to get some brainstorming going among the participants to see um, what you might know that you could share. Nail. So please just unmute yourself and shout it out. Snails are one. Snails. Yeah. Mice um, sometimes have ovo testes. Chickens can change their genders. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of plants mm -hmm. that do different things. So I'm thinking of seahorses and the way that sort of females have an ovipositor that um, they, and they interact with males in a way where the males carry the young. And then I love that there's a whole book about all of this called Biological Exuberance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, My go ahead. Somebody else time it's on? Yeah, but go ahead to ask, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to say, you mentioned oysters. I know from, um, David ha has worked with oysters, but also a lot, um, we do a lot of shell fishing and, and studying of shellfish on the island. And I know that a lot of bivalves um, have very interesting and, 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 and different processes. Yeah, a lot of the times it's the environment that decides what gender has been taken on. So it's not decided um, when, when they're what when they're produced it's decided later on in the process and i find that very fascinating hmm. perfect F feeds right into because one of my favorite of that sort is turtles because there are a lot of turtles that I'm trying to remember it i believe the warmer temperatures they're if they're when the eggs are warmer temperature i think they're male and in cooler temperatures they're females um i think it's that direction because there's worry about it with climate warming whether there will be not enough females. Um, so they're, you know, there's temperature induced. My favorite plant of that sort is Jack in the pulpit. So some of them are really Jill in the pulpit. Um, mm -hmm. That when they've got a lot of nutrients in their roots, they, they, they're female and otherwise they're male. So. Thank you. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I, Lily and I were um, reading today about fungi and I don't know if we have the fact written down 36,000 sexes right <laughs> fungi can have 36,000 sexes which mate with each other in a mysterious process involving underground fronds is what this particular article said I'm not sure that I would uh, that seems like strange language to use fronds um, but uh, yeah we've we've come across a lot of examples so it seems like we're all familiar with this concept that nature can be pretty queer in this regard. Um, we also just wanted to briefly go over a list of the animals that display homosexual behavior just to normalize and naturalize this. Um, in case you aren't familiar, amongst mammals, baboons, bison, brown bear, brown rats, caribous, cats, cattle, chimpanzees, dolphins, marmosets, dogs, elephants, foxes, giraffes, goats, Horses, obviously humans, koalas, lions, orcas, pandas, and raccoons can all exhibit homosexual behavior. And amongst birds, barn owls, chickens, as we mentioned, emus, the common gull, sparrows, kestrels, penguins, mallards, ostriches, ravens, doves, seagulls, swans, turkeys, and vultures have all been documented to exhibit homosexual behavior. As well as anglerfish, uh, sunfish, graylings, bitterlings, swordtails, uh, there's so many. And then so many reptiles, the bearded dragon, the gecko. This is just in the service of like really normalizing this behavior in nature. Uh, salamanders, the black spotted frog, the uh, tanger desert toad, um, and then so many different insects from weevils and wasps to all different kinds of beetles and bees, um, and then there's other invertebrates as well. So there are many, many examples of this in nature. Um, 
which is what this quote that was shared is pointing to. So nature itself is pretty queer as a starting point, um, just to help us to come to a point of acceptance and appreciation for this phenomenon, not only in human ecology, but also in the ecology that surrounds us and that we participate in. Um, and then we were wondering also what some representations of human queerness that you might be aware of that preceded uh, colonialism. So should we give some examples of this? Sure. So um, something that comes to, so third gender is something that we hear about now when we're doing research on decolonialism in the Americas. Um, <clears throat> one word for that third gender that existed amongst uh, people indigenous to the lands that are now called the United States um, was the two-spirit. Has anybody heard of that before? Which was a, really a, a term coined in 1990 in retaliation against a uh, colonial term um say again the bear dash i think is yes how you pronounce it which was bird bird dash bird bird dash i'm not sure how, how to pronounce it but um it, but a derogatory in the sense of um minimizing and demonizing uh queerness among native people and so the term two-spirit was coined to reclaim uh, identity and also to separate um, queer indigenous folks out of just the LGBT community lump um, to, to kind of solidify that you know they're here they're queer and they're indigenous and have experienced um the trauma coming from this line of colonization and the erasure so there there are many peoples across cultures throughout history who have had terms um for uh androgynous people queer people uh, third gender, non-binary people. Um, <clears throat> and these concept of, concepts have existed, as we've been talking about, throughout nature forever, but they've also existed in human nature forever, and they've existed globally, um, documented throughout civilization. Mm -hmm. Is it okay if I point to a couple more specific examples? Please, yeah. So one example that comes to my mind, because this class of people were just uh, <clears throat> were just given visibility by the Indian government, they're called the Hijra class, and they are a class of eunuchs, but now that present uh, mostly as transgender women. Um, and eunuchs, I think, are a cross-cultural phenomenon that we see in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome, and also um, in a lot of different, uh, like, Pan Middle Eastern cultures. Um, but I just want to, I'm not going to try and pronounce all of the names, but there's a list that one can access on Wikipedia. But in Maori culture, this exists. In the Philippines, this exists. In Indonesia, amongst the Scythians, in Samoa, in the Tongo, in Italy. Uh, there were a couple of different ones. One that, like, a friend of mine has been identifying deeply with lately called the Feminiello. Um, the uh in thailand uh, um, in arab speaking lands uh amongst the turks in siberia in hawaii and tahiti in uh, malaysia uh, amongst zapotec mexicans um, in argentina and peru and then i wanted to point to my culture which is uh jewish uh, that we actually have six genders represented in judaism zakar um, Nekieve, these all come from the Torah, um, the Tanakh, 
and and there's many more besides. And I also wanted to point to the fact that uh, these third gender statuses were oftentimes revered in the cultures that they are indigenous to. They were considered to be sacred, holy roles to play in a society. Um, <clears throat> and also point to the fact that historically, before Christianity was, and, and the Old Testament and the New Testament were canonized by the Council of Nicaea, that in ancient Gnostic traditions, and also in alchemical traditions and hermeticism, there is also a concept of the sacred androgen, which is androgen, which is, uh, they use this funny term fermentation that's applied as an alchemical term to describe the sacred union within one being of masculine and feminine attributes. So um, <clears throat> prior to colonization, this was common in culture across the world. Uh, just again to sort of naturalize this and we were wondering if anybody in the group had an example that they would like to share either from their culture or one that they visited or if they have alternative pronouns that they've heard because they speak another language or um, anything like that. Um. I can share a little bit. Uh, I learned, and I just quickly want to really credit one of my oldest teachers, uh, Raven Caldera, who is a transgender activist and spirit worker, and has done a lot of trying to recover queerness in Northern European traditions, which are shockingly rife with tons of queer stuff. Like, I'm sure, we, we, I don't want to get into mythology, here, but there's a, uh, um, okay, well, we can, we can talk a little bit about that, but there are, um, there's, there's this, there's a word, um, which is sort of an old Norse word, uh, ergi, E-R-G-I, which we first learn about it as, as kind of an insult, um, as something that is meant to sort of convey, um, if, like being effeminate, or being weak, but there's some sort of intriguing evidence that before this sort of negative association, that it had a lot more to do with being a, like a queer magic worker. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. I definitely want to learn more about that, whatever, whatever source you could provide for for us ash um because i personally i mean i haven't delved enough into it but i haven't seen much about um northern european uh histories on queerness and i would love to learn more so thank you does anyone else have anyone does anyone have anything else to add before we move on? Saskia, okay. I can't hear you, Saskia. I think you're muted, Saskia. Yes, I was trying to unmute myself, sorry. Yeah, just a short example, because I don't know that much about it, but I felt like uh where I grew up was in the Netherlands, and we spent a lot of time um, learning about Greek mythology, and um, it was very common knowledge by all the teachers and the students, and it was also looked upon as something really uh, special and unique was hermaphrodites. And of course, hermaphrodites, um, or hemaphrodites uh, would be the Greek word, um, are of course, um, any type of plant or animal who who carry both sexes inside of them. So it could be uh, the same thing that we were referring to earlier, like slugs, for example. And, um, but it was also uh, common in, in um, not very common, but it was kind of like a unique role, but um, hemaphrodite, she, uh, she or they, we would call them right now, back then, sh she was referred to as a she for whatever reason, because that was maybe the person their personal preference 
um, was a very important mythological character who both had um, a vagina and had a penis and and could actually also reproduce apparently both ways and it was um I thought it was really cool that we got to talk about that when we were teenagers and there were also lots of different examples people would talk about it in a newspaper how there were all kinds of people that were born um differently with different types of variations of of maybe being hermaphrodite or maybe some of them were fertile some of them were not and how did that work out and yeah i feel like in general that especially coming from um a northern european culture it was much more normalized and um at a much earlier time so i felt thankful to grow up in that you know in that um yeah in that context mm. thank, thank you. you for sharing so uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Do folks want to talk about this a little bit more and spitball other examples and explore that? Or um, should we start sharing some concrete suggestions to help you support yourself and others in community, especially kids that are um, on the path to, you know, hoping to accept themselves? Yes, is that a finger that wants to say something, Camilo? Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm curious as to like how how all of you um, you know bring this into your practice. I'm imagining it's it's kind of hard given a lot of different obstacles. But um, what are what are things people are doing as of right now? Because that's where I'm at with my program, uh, where where I work at. Um, that that there's definitely not like this consensus that we've been talking about there's not even that consensus yet i don't think mm -hmm. i mean it's not spoken and so um that's a good important first step but i also feel like you know some practical um practices and to support some of the kids in our programs mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I, I can start a little bit with this. Um, <clears throat> something that I think is so simple, but is, is maybe I think of as simple because it's become such a part of my daily experience, is in programs, um, starting off the day with an introduction uh, or reintroduction within the group and just giving an opportunity for people to state their name, their pronouns, and whatever else. Um, because I think for a lot of kids who are figuring out how they want to be referred to, it can be really uncomfortable and it's really uncomfortable for adults talking personally. Um, to uh, state your chosen pronoun if if it's changing or it's in flux or you know last week you were in the program and you were going by she her pronouns but now you're feeling unsure and you want to go by they them pronouns um, I think that it's it's a really safe way just in the beginning of the day to open up that opportunity um for everyone to to state where they're at so that there is not a uh, spotlight put on anyone um and i don't see this happening across programs yet sorry what, who, what was that that was my computer saying that it's four o'clock <laughs> oh. okay <laughs> um i don't see that happening in a lot of programs uh, not universally yet. And the program that I used to work for, um, we had several non-binary students and trans students um, over the course of years and their pronouns changed and their names changed all the time. 
and um, where when it wasn't being stated to the whole group to all the other students it was hard for them to um, know what to call their classmate um, where maybe the uh, the parent of that student had told the director of our program but it wasn't relayed to anyone else and then it wasn't um, then it, it came up in in horrible traumatic situations where the student was being misgendered or being called the wrong name um, and and I think that that can be avoided uh. yeah I think starting with the adults in the group is is the best way to go so like something that I didn't do that I would usually do in an introduction because it felt like kind of rushed and people were still coming into the call was uh, not only introduce because <clears throat> this also ties in with the with the decolonialism that we're working towards right um not just your pronouns like my name is lily sage and i use she or they pronouns but also your positionality like i am i come from several generations of displaced people and refugees and i'm of the Jewish diaspora, if that's like the kind of information that feels safe to share in the group, which hopefully it is along with your pronouns, right? If it's a hostile situation, then nobody's gonna wanna share anyways that much information about themselves. And and then you can even go on to say something like, I currently occupy, you know, Lenny Lenape land. Um, and I think that's a really good starting point for both opening up dialogue and thinking around colonialism and gender. And you wanna start that in with the adults first and then bring it to the kids after there's some level of comfort around it amongst the adults because otherwise it can get weird pretty fast. Do you agree, Mishka? <laughs> I do, yes, I do. And another way to like kind of kick that off if you don't feel like that's something that is safe for you to personally initiate in your work environment is to ask the director of your program if you're not the director of your program to hire somebody who is you know gender queer agender non-binary trans um as a consultant to like try and figure out how to get you on your game um and then we we have some thoughts about like how to go about this in a way that's meaningful and that doesn't tokenize people um I don't know if you want to share about that, Mishka, or if you would like me to. I don't know if I feel ready to share about that. Yeah, we don't have to go there just yet. Mm -hmm. um, are there more questions or thoughts that people want to share around that? I actually have a, a question, um, which is that, so, so when, we, when we introduce ourselves and our pronouns, um, and potentially, on some levels, our family histories, um, I just want to be aware that that can be really complicated for kids who might be adopted and don't know their history or um, people whose history has been assimilated over the last hundred years and don't know, or mm -hmm. people who know something, but they're not really allowed to know it or people who are in between spaces that that can be more complicated. Um, and also those histories are so often based on some trauma. And so if we're asking kids to talk about those histories, we want to be, careful about what residual trauma we're bringing in on our levels as adults who are aware of what we're talking about and what that looks like and what that means and what ages kids were using what kids were working with and what that looks like to them who may or may not have a sense of that trauma depending on where their families are from and what their families have been through um so there's there's some questions about about that particular family history type stuff that comes in Yes, mm. I'm just as a point of clarification, I meant that as my introduction with adults. Um, with children, I don't think I would get that complicated because they yeah. may not, I mean, depending upon the age of the child, they may not even know what I'm talking about at all. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. And I figured that was, I just wanted to toss that in there too, but I, I figured you meant totally with adults as well. Um, but it is still complicated for adults to answer totally. that question and sometimes brings up you know, it makes it less of a safe space to figure out how to do that. Um, 
So it's complicated, but good, not bad, but complicated. Yeah, mm -hmm. agreed. I had two thoughts I wanted to toss in, in terms of the answering the question around um, things you can do in your programs. And one of them is, there's some really beautiful nature connection stories out there about queer people. And like, if, if you have access to those stories, um, telling, telling those stories uh, can, be, can be one way of bringing queerness into your programs. The other thing, and uh, something that certainly has been kind of like a, not a great experience for me all, all times is around, is around single gender spaces. Like I, I do like really strongly feel like there's a lot of helpfulness and healing in having like a, like a women's circle or men's circle. But just if you're going to do that, like just, you know, put a lot, uh, put some thought and care and an intention into that around like how that would, how, how if you are dividing kids up by gender, how are kids who aren't really sure about their gender going to receive that? So just being intentional around single gender spaces you're creating. Hmm. Yeah, when, um, when Saskia brought up the idea of us facilitating this webinar, I actually thought at first that it was about um, creating safe spaces specifically in like uh, gender segregated uh, like rite of passage spaces. So that was kind of where my thinking was too. Um, what, what, do fo what are folks' experiences with that so far? Does anybody have anything that they would like to share along those lines? Yeah, go ahead, Saskia. Wow, I've got like so many questions right now. <laughs> um, well, what has come up for us that we feel that um, and I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on that, that the moment that you're offering single gender spaces, um, I think we are, be we are beginning to embrace that um, at Sassafras that there should always be another option. Mm -hmm. So uh, how, how, how do you, um, how do you see that? Like, for example, if you are deciding to split up and you're giving children a, um, a choice, um, how would you phrase that? How would you frame that? What does that third choice look like? And do you feel like there always should be a third choice? Because otherwise, even although you might frame it beautifully and say all kinds of things around it, but what are your actions, right? What are you modeling? So my, my question about that, or one of my questions is then, um, single gender spaces, shouldn't they always be, shouldn't they always be accompanied by a f either fluid gender space um, or, I'm not so good with the terminology, should I say binary gender space? Binary yeah. you know, two two genders. So that, so that would then be usually male and female, understood to, to people as male and female. Would anyone like to answer that? I feel like I'm talking a lot, so I apologize. I'm no, really it's okay. This. <laughs> um, one thing that I, I think comes into play with this is there's some really beautiful mythology around queerness and like the mythological role of queer folk in community, like in terms of being edge walkers, in terms of being bridge builders. And you can, that, that, that's a, like a fruitful realm to draw on is like the mythological role of queerness when you're figuring out what kind of other space to create uh, something I've heard folks use is sort of some, some stellar language, like a sun circle for folks who identify as male, a moon circle who ident for folks who identify as female, and a star circle for people who uh, don't identify with either of those things. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, that's really, really beautiful. Um, Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. 
I think it's interesting that a lot, like what you see a lot in Nature Connection um, and in other spaces as well these days is there's a men's group, there's a women's group and attached to that is sort of the LGBT or queer group, which is sort of to acknowledge that queer people aren't safe in men's spaces, <laughs> apparently, totally. Um, but often queer people aren't totally safe in female spaces either not totally. So there, there is sort of a need for a third space or a third option in certain ways. And in other ways, not. I mean, I think it depends on the individual person who's coming to find their space. Um, and, and it depends on what they're, what they're really looking for. So um, there's not an easy yes or no or kind of prescriptive answer to that question. Mm -hmm. It depends on where people are coming from and what they need. Um, which I guess on a certain level speaks to asking questions of who your people are and what do they want and what do they need. Mm -hmm. um, and someplace in rural Maine or someplace in Vermont or someplace in Western Massachusetts or someplace in Boston, they all might need different things. Um, so it would be interesting. I, I guess the asking is kind of an interesting question too. Mm -hmm. And then there comes the question of what do you do if you don't have someone who can facilitate that third space, um, or you do, but they might not have the right resources, and um, how do you yourself get educated on this? Um, which I think, you know, queer people don't have all the answers about these things, and. Um, a lot of a lot of the questions that come up uh, are need to be researched by the individual who's having the questions come up um, because we we are in a time in the world where we're needing to find new ways of being new ways of communicating um, sharing language with each other and experience and um i i i think some something that at least that i come come up against in, in my experience working for my uh, previous job as a as a, an outdoor educator um i found that i was often chosen as the person who uh, had to facilitate the queer students. And that was hard for me. It at times was triggering. It was hard to, it was a lot of emotional labor on my part to have to try and explain to my employer um, why we use certain words and the importance of um, being careful with people who are going through transitions. Um, and I didn't feel like I should have been the one to do that work. I think that if I were hired to do that work, it would be a different situation. Um, but really my employer should have been educating himself um and and finding outside resources to uh to learn how he could be a better mentor to queer students yeah that's huge mm -hmm. really huge and it brings up a really interesting point that Lily Sage also brought up, which is that queer people need jobs that actually pay mm -hmm. things for us to be good at what we're good at and knows the stuff we know and not educate for free all the time because <laughs> we're the ones who know stuff, but we don't know all queer kids. And so, and different queer kids need different stuff. Mm -hmm. And so to be that facilitator without being specifically hired to be in that role and to be that expert is really hard and it is really triggering and complicated if um if it's not your innate purpose i totally mm -hmm. totally hear that
Yeah, we wanted also just to shout out that that's the case also as we're on this decolonialism and like anti-bias, anti-racist journey that there's so many, so many, so many resources now on the internet, although not all of them are good. So you have to learn how to navigate with a critically reflective eye as well. Um, and also, of course, remember that there, there are no really, I mean, there's some universal experiences like we all know that we're gonna die and that's the one inevitability of our life, but, um, but that everybody has a different experience. And so to take each experience as just that, um, but that uh, we, we all could stand to do more research on our own and, and not rely too heavily upon people that occupy various intersecting marginalities in our spheres. I, I agree that we all need to help educate ourselves, but with that caveat, um, if anybody has valuable resources that sites they think are exceptionally good, um, especially that we can show other people too, it's worth having trying to come up with some of those lists to share with, with everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd be delighted to share some resources to that end. And also, I mean, there's a whole publishing industry now that is like latching onto like a need for children's literature that deals with these topics as well. So I've been coming across lots of wonderful books that like, even if you don't feel like you can gracefully communicate or like express whatever you need to along these lines, there's a good children's book that you can turn to, like if you don't feel like you have adequate language yourself. Definitely. There's a bunch of really fun resources out there these days. Mm -hmm. Also in the chat box, there's the beginning of quite a lovely list as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which I would, uh, Lily and I will, Put all these resources that we've gotten and that are in the chat um, together uh, and can send out to the NCLC. Please. And right? <laughs> NCLC. Yeah. Something I also want to mention just in, in the sense of resources, and I, I don't know these folks well enough to call this a recommendation, but you know, this is these are some folks to who are worth asking some questions about is there's this sort of like this group of people, a group of queer and trans uh, New England based nature programming facilitators called the Wild Geese Collective. I think they're kind of forming so they don't have a web presence and I don't know them well yet, but if somebody who's going to be at the conference this year, Caitlin Horrigan, I know is involved in that group. And if you are somebody who wants to hire um, queer nature connection facilitators, either for the, like a, just a short program or uh, looking for queer staff, they're a, maybe they might be a good group to reach out to. Thank you. The recommendation. I wasn't aware of them. Yep. I will also include the Wild Goose Collective in our. Uh, oh, it's already here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so, to that end, we wanted, we did want to talk a little bit about like consultants. Do you want to get into that, Mishka, or what's your thought? Well, <laughs> let me just be really upfront <laughs> with everyone. So I've been I've been personally um, going through a lot the past few weeks, slash, forever and ever and always, um, with my own gender and um, just just going through a transition again with myself and just trying to hear myself out and figure out where I'm at. Um, and so I, I've been in a really gender dysphoric state for the past few weeks, um, which for me manifests in having like pretty intense brain fog 
um, having a really hard time um, staying present and accessing my own vocabulary and my own knowledge <laughs> that I have. So, so uh, we're talking about right now under different circumstances would be really easy for me to answer and would be really easy for me to talk about. Um, and at the moment, I feel like it's hard. It's hard for me to access that information and spitfire my ideas. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, in to that, uh, I would ask for anyone who who has answers to or can expand on this to expand on this is it okay uh, also for me to just ask real quick mishka if everybody is familiar with that terminology what it means to be gender disparate sure, ask ask away is there, is there anybody who isn't familiar with that with gender dysphoria specifically do you want to speak to it or would you like me to i can try Okay. Yeah. And anyone else can too. <laughs> um, is there anyone who is unsure about, I can't see if people yeah. are raising hands. Yeah. Yeah. There was somebody who raised their hand. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So, I mean, gender dysphoria manifests itself in all kinds of ways for, for different people. Um, and in my body, uh, I, will get into a space of feeling really disconnected from my actual body um, to the body that I have in my mind or to not just body, but my whole being feels misaligned. Um, and it, and it makes it hard for me to um, really feel grounded and kind of makes me feel estranged from myself um and uh yeah i i i then feel like i'm in a state of flux or like i'm having some kind of crisis where i need to figure out who i am and how how to get people to see me as how i see myself um and 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 i usually feel pretty emotional and um easily triggered um yeah that's my that's my experience with gender dysphoria but th that's a less like clinical description i i thought it was worth um just clarifying because this is like kind of an underlying reason for me at least why it's really important that we make sure that our work is inclusive and that it recognizes everybody's gender and name of the moment because um because a, a child or an adult but i think especially tender our children who gets triggered into like this kind of dissociative state can have potentially very dangerous consequences for their physical and emotional well-being, which is why the onus is really upon us as educators to do the best that we can to accommodate uh, whatever identities they may bring to the table on a given day. So that, that thank you for sharing that experience, mm -hmm. Misha. Um, and I, I think that like kind of puts a human face so that you can see right now, <laughs> that even though it, it's pretty white in the light. Yeah, it's um, all glared <laughs> out. Over on, here. on an experience that you may not have heard about before. So I really appreciate you sharing, Mishka. That was really vulnerable and beautiful. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if anyone else would like to expand on that, um, please feel free. I think it's I think it's valuable to to know. I don't think that a lot of um, I don't, I don't think everyone knows what gender dysphoria is in the first place, let alone what it feels like, um, but, but also what it feels like as a child and um, how unsure in the world you can feel. I mean, 
I, I know how it feels as an adult and I know how it felt as a child. Um, and, you know, when you have a lot of sources uh, kind of telling you who you should be and how you're supposed to be, and that isn't matching how you feel inside, um, you can feel pretty delicate. Um, and I have had experiences of uh, students of mine um, really struggling with gender dysphoria during programs um, because of all kinds of factors, but also be because they were triggered by other students misgendering them um, and not out of any intent for harm from those students, but a lack of infrastructure in our program as to you know how how to talk about pronouns and how to talk about name change and um, and just queerness in nature and and in general. Um, so yeah, I th I think that um, I think this this is a, a one of the more important things for us as educators to look into and do our own research on um, and really take into consideration when you're when you're meeting anyone who might be queer um, or anyone in general uh, because it's so it it is so easy to um, in my experience just to give an example um, uh, I, I've had the experience in the past few weeks of being really irritated by strangers uh, referring to me with she, her pronouns, just like in, in the grocery store um, to employees communicating to each other about something that I ordered at the deli and referring to me as Miss um they wouldn't know any better in in the moment because of their environment and you know what what they're exposed to um but that was really triggering for me and i ended up going home and feeling like totally lost in myself um and so you know it's a it's just a really delicate topic that I think we need to be more informed on. Thanks for sharing your tenderness. Thank yeah. you. Totally. Yeah, thank you, Mishka. Thank you. I think those things are so important. I think if we look at the educational system that we're working in and nature connection, and we look at expecting kids to pee outside, and we look a bit at gender dysphoria and how people get out of their clothes in order to use their anatomy to do the things that they need to do and where we expect them to do that and the lack of privacy we expect them to do that in or the mm -hmm. amount of walking into that tree that we thought was private for a minute or whatever and that kids have a super extra layer of that if they're feeling gender dysphoric um, or feeling unsafe around the other kids that they're with or around the, the teachers. And they don't usually, as children, have language for that fear. It's just mm -hmm. innate. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of times we talk about trauma-informed practices in education, and we talk about trauma-informed practices in doctor's offices and, and all these different things. We don't often talk about that, that kids don't really have a language to describe their feeling of alienness or their feeling of difference. Um, and so, and we can't be like, we can't give them that language. It's not a process that they yet have in their brain that they'll grow into that language as they get older. But um, we just have to provide the structure of safety. Um, and so, you know, bouncing off of, you know, dysphoria, 
out in the world at stores or at the deli or, or in bathrooms or in, in all the different kinds of things and we bring that back into the educational setting of the woods, how can we provide a safe place um, for kids who are exploring their gender in different ways to have that feel positive for them instead of painful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, RJ. And <clears throat> one of the things that I really like about being in the nature connection world and one of the things that sort of makes me feel kind of hopeful about this work that we do is that I feel like of all of the millions of people in on Turtle Island, I feel like like as a as a <clears throat> huh, okay, so as a queer person, something I'm sort of kind of looking for when I'm going into a space is this just a basic social norm that it's okay, you don't have to show up and be a certain way. Like you can be your unique self and be that unique, beautiful individual self and find welcome in that uniqueness. And I feel like nature connection as a field is, it's, it's, is, is much closer to being able to do that well than other fields because that's what we, in a way, that's how we approach the wild world, the other than human world. Like we approach each animal or we hopefully approach all the animals as unique beings that are worthy of understanding their uniqueness. And I resonate with that in this field, in my approach to animals and or like non other than human animals. And I feel like it's an approach I look for and I try to offer with my students. Like I want to welcome your uniqueness and learn about your uniqueness. And I'm not gonna demand that you fit into one or two or three or some small set of molds. I want to learn about what your uniqueness is this week, today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That's, yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important to relate this to nature because, um, yeah, uh, introduction and care and respect among beings is at the core of what we're talking about. Yeah, and I feel like in particular in the sphere that we're trying to expand upon uh, decolonialism, it requires for us to start thinking about it seriously, sort of flipping notions both of white supremacy but also human supremacy on its head. Mm -hmm. And part of that is, is, you know, engaging with the more than human world uh, precisely as that, um, as, as beings that have inherent worth and value just like we do, if not more so, hard to know, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that demands also that, you know, we treat each other with at least the same level of respect. And part of that has to do with, you know, getting to know one another's idiosyncrasies and respecting and caring for them. So I guess this would be a good time to see if you know if anyone has any more questions or or is needing some expansion on things we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. I'm a little while back, somebody was talking about consultants and I didn't quite hear that question. And I'm wondering if whoever asked that could, could say that question again. RJ mentioned it. Um, I had mentioned it also, but we didn't get into it yet. Mm, okay. In a deep way, yeah. RJ, do you wanna say more about that? Um, not particularly. Okay. <laughs> um, so Mishka and I had talked about, should, should we just go into this now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, these are my notes. I'll read them. Um, that, um, a consideration 
that one could take, particularly if one is in a director position within an organization, is to hire and openly, as, as the Wild Geese Collective that you mentioned, uh, openly uh, gender queer, agender, non-binary, trans, etc., queer people um, uh, as a consultant. And then we have a little piece here about tokenization and quotas that I don't know if we really got into too deeply, but we can expand upon it here. Um, that tokenization kind of inherently sucks, but also if your organization, just like if your organization is really white and you wanna create safer spaces for more bi POC to be part of the mix and also to welcome more bi POC children, then you should probably consider like starting with a consultant so that the space is safer to welcome those people into the fold. And then you just want to work on as best as you can hiring as much staff as possible that's by POC. And the same goes for the spectrum of different gender identities. Um, so. As well as ranging abilities would be. Yes. <laughs> Um, Plop that in there because yes. intersectionality is important. Yep. Oh. Um, and also because, it, and this is, uh, that's really loaded in nature connection work, I feel. And that Very. can be like another webinar. Because, <laughs> like, like, how do you get webinars. somebody in a wheelchair? Like, I don't even know. It's like really hard, like, doing natural camo and stalking when you're in a wheelchair, or, you know, there's like, that's a huge can of worms. But yes, I'm glad that it was mentioned. Um, and just like I, people who identify potentially as neuroatypical you know, staff, staff who, you know, have intersecting identities. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Um, and then this ties in with something that you said, RJ, and you also said, Mishka, which was that if you're hiring somebody for the express purpose, of having them as a representative of a particular identity in your organization, then you need to pay them accordingly and make it really explicit that that's the role that you expect them to fill. Mm -hmm. So that means probably actually paying them a little bit more than the rest of your staff, at least. Uh, if they're in a consultancy role, then, uh, then they're probably just there for a short contract and or maybe a repeating short contract to check in to see how your progress is going. And Simon, you might have more to say about this because I think Wild Earth has gone down this path to a certain extent, although I could be mistaken. That was my understanding. Um, but uh, you need to like first create a safe environment to welcome those staff so that you can also welcome those children. Um, yeah, Simon, did you want to share about that at all? Is that the case at Wild Earth? Yeah, we, we, we're working in this. Um, Ooh, can't really hear you. Sorry, I had a lot of background noise. Probably not a good time to do this. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, if you're hiring somebody who's like really fulfilling a tokenized role in your organization, then be prepared to pay them more than the rest of your staff and think of that as reparations, as, as kind of the what I would go with personally. I, I'm not a director of an organization, so that's uh, not an issue that I have at the moment, but uh, think of it as reparations is, is kind of the way that I would think about that. Does anybody have thoughts that they want to share on that point or questions? Um, I think a good way of, of sort of um, framing that as like thinking about it as reparations or thinking about it as something is is that that person is like likely in a trauma informed sense of 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 life been through whatever they've been through and worked through enough that they're decent enough at getting a job that they're going to do it pretty well but they're going to have vicarious trauma which is something we talk about in you know police work and hospital work and clinic work and shelter work and we talk about vicarious trauma in lots of different ways and by by doing that work that's sort of tokenized in a certain level, um, they're going to be re-triggered from all their old crap numerous times and continue to work through it because that's their job and that's they wanted that job and they, they did that job. Um, but it, it's going to take time for 
that person, but also the people in those communities to be in a place where being in a cisgendered space isn't triggering or um, all kinds of, I don't know. It's getting a little convoluted in my brain because I'm it's past three, so I'm tired. But um, <laughs> um, but sort of the the idea of like trauma informed practice as we as we work with our kids and also looking at our staff and the vicarious trauma that they'll be going through as being maybe the only person of color or being the only um, LGBT you know star for everybody in in, in that umbrella. Um, kind of person around that there's there's extra work to be done in order to just show up for the day mm -hmm. and then throughout the day also like being positioned in such a way that everybody uses you as the go-to for that particular line of inquiry yes yeah Yeah, um, I want to share another quote here real fast from Queer Nature um, that is, it is clear to us that an even larger ecological notion of solidarity is called for that defies easy political categorization. Um, I think, that, I don't know, that holds a lot of resonance for me. Uh, Say it one more time. Yeah, Sorry. it is clear to us that an even larger ecological notion of solidarity is called for that defies easy political categorization. I'm gonna break that down a little bit. <laughs> um, well, I guess, so we are, like as nature educators, we're aware that we're part of a greater whole. Uh, we have our personal ecosystems that are like our social milieus or the spheres that we occupy. And then there's the greater ecology of the place that we inhabit. Um, and therefore, uh, with this broader awareness of the natural world, like say you're somebody who engages in a sit spot regularly and, uh, you, and you have some connectiveness to the greater world, we also have some, and, and that is a microcosm in and of itself, whatever creatures you're interacting with or encountering in your sit spot. Um, we also have this broader notion of solidarity, which is like being able to provide care, resources, support to beings in the natural world, like as in human supremacy, how we think about like ourselves being separate and above like a higher, more evolved form of life, right? Like the ultimate form of evolution. Um, and uh, the same goes also for, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if this feels like it's rambling a little bit at this point. Um, that we all, while we need to pro provide support and solidarity uh, as you know probably environmentalists being you know that being one of our political identities along with being nature educators that we also need to be providing that kind of solidarity across genders across race across you know different human identities as well does that make sense yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, everybody was just looking at me blankly. <laughs> <laughs> it made sense to me. Okay. <laughs> um, so I feel like this gets us kind of at a point also where we should address identity politics. Has anybody heard of that term before? Yeah. So <clears throat> identity politics, I think like in a lot of like broader, like kind of leftist political leaning spheres can be like pretty easily problematized um, because a lot of leftists would say, and I don't know, I don't pretend to assume that that's your political affiliation, but this is my analytical background would be uh, that they can be stratifying, they can separate us. Like, I don't know if any of you followed or participated in Occupy Wall Street, but there were so many different affinity groups that if you ever attended uh, one of their, you know, direct democracy meetings, they, they could last for hours because everybody had different goals. Um, and, and those goals can uh, like be, cause like a sense of separateness in a movement, right? Like if you're, I'm again gonna draw from this example, like if Occupy Wall Street was trying to overthrow Wall Street, truly, if that was really their goal, then, Un having everybody unify under an anti-capitalist banner or something as opposed to like all of the different individual needs that were called for in the different affinity groups 
would probably be a helpful starting point would be like a critique that a lot of people would make of that movement um, as well as it being populist, but that's a different issue. Um, and likewise, I think a lot of what I've encountered initially when trying to bring up these conversations in nature connection community is that like people are like, well, everybody's just people or something universalizing like that. Like we all want the same things, which like kind of glosses over the need to respect identities, I think, or like some of the core differences that we do hold, even though yes, we are all human beings <laughs> and, and, and like all have to pee and poop and drink water and eat and like have shelter and warmth and you know, these other kinds of things that are definitely universal. Um, so I guess um, something that I wanna say about this is that while like, maybe you're struggling with this, like bringing identity politics as a construct into your like critical reflection on the work that you're doing, that uh, ultimately I think people having a stronger like core in their own sense of identity, strengthening that can actually then ultimately serve to bring people together. Like once that's a little bit less insecure, that can actually create space for more cohesiveness. Does this make sense to folks so far? Are you following? Mm -hmm. okay. um, so this also inspires me to bring in another quote from Queer Nature, unless y'all wanna talk about that first or ask a question about that or, um, which is <clears throat> being in relationship as a core practice of, decoloniz of decolonizing nature connection and dismantling human supremacy. We must embrace consent culture with the more than human community as well. And remember that a core practice of solidarity is to listen. So like part of that deep listening is also like welcoming and accepting and respecting um, identities that we've met, maybe never even encountered or heard of, as well as you know those that we encounter in the wild, so to speak. Thank you. I think that's a lot. I think we just we put a lot out there, and I I want. I think it was all, it it was all stated really clearly. Um, I want to see if anyone needs any kind of uh, further clarification or has questions um, or comments as we're getting near to the end of this time together. Right. Oh, uh, Mishka, before we, I also just want to, can we still talk about financial accessibility and scholarships? Sure. Um, yes. But some, someone was just going to ask. Something. Okay, yeah, please. Hi, I'm Andy. I use he, him Hi. pronouns. Sorry, I missed the, the beginning. I work out at uh, Wilderness Awareness School, and I work with uh, teenagers. We do weekend expeditions with them. And uh, a question I had is if any of you have found um, with overnight programs, especially with teenagers, um, a way to set up sleeping in a way that feels inclusive. We, um, on away trips, we often are able to just say camping is over there and all the teens just kind of set their tents up. But when we're um, first starting out a program, we don't know the teens yet. We don't have much understanding of how they're going to relate and interact. We want to create safe space. Um, it's been just tricky to figure out how to create sleeping areas for um, for everyone in a way that's inclusive. And so I'm just curious if anyone has experienced a way that works really well for, for them. I'd like to open this up really to everyone because I don't have personally enough experience leading programs um, and this being and this coming up and personally having to to figure this out and it seems like one of one of the initial reasons why Lily and I um, discussed doing a webinar back in last this past January um, was because we had a little breakout group at the Nature Connection Leadership Conference 
during during a lunch where we talked about queer rites of passage. And this question came up of how do we deal with um, creating safe and inclusive sleeping arrangements during overnight programs. So I would love to hear <laughs> what everyone has to say, if anyone has anything to add or you've had experience with this um, or you have ideas, uh, because I know that this is um, presently a concern for a lot of people running programs. Um, go ahead, Ash. Oh, well, thank you. And first of all, hi, Andy. It is so good to see you. It's just a joy to see your face. Um, and I, I don't have a like a clear direct answer for you, but I have a connection. Um, if you, so I think um, Camp 10 Trees, uh, which is a queer residential camp in Washington state, they're really awesome folks. They, they, aren't do, they aren't running on the Eight Shields model. They're doing things a little bit differently. But I, they have absolutely thought of this question and have needed to reckon with it a lot. So I would encourage you to Google Camp 10 Trees and reach out to their staff. RJ, did you have something to share on this point as well? Um, yeah, I think that some of the question can be answered in prep work, um, by which I mean, if you have an inclusive sign-up form that, that says, that has different gendered options, that has a question on there about sleeping arrangements, um, because, Hello. Because I think that um, different kids in different gendered situations feel safe in different ways, whether they're LGBT or not LGBT, actually. Um, and so there's, there's some, especially with teenagers, um, and there's a lot more in, in different schools, there is a lot more modeling of uh, more, <laughs> for lack of a better terminology, co-ed or um, more complex gendered sleeping situations. There's much more modeling over the last 10 years um, than, than there really ever has been a lot more inclusivity in that way. But if, if it's stated on your um, intake work, then every child and every child's parent reading and filling out that paperwork has to acknowledge that there may be people there with different genders. Um, which is just to open the floor for that discussion as an organization, as, as parents and, and facilitators, as students and facilitators, with students and parents. It just opens the conversation to everybody to have it become normal um, and feel normal to the participants and feel normal to the parents who are really the people who you have to prove it to on a certain level anyway. Um, (laughs) They're the ones who tend to have more complicated reactions to different sleeping arrangements. Mm -hmm. So by putting it on the intake form, it opens the discussion for the whole pile of can of worms, well, the whole can of worms to be open. And then solutions can be, can be created. Um, and then if you have students who say, yes, I'm, um, you know, LGBT, whatever, then, um, you can reach out to that child and those parents and have a conversation with them about what might be the most comfortable in different ways as well. And, and be honest and say, we're practicing this. This is not totally new. We've heard about it before, we, we do stuff, but it's also, we're wanting to do this well. And so your feedback as we learn these things and is helpful to us. And when we mess up, tell us, and we will acknowledge that as best we can. Um, So process-wise, I think those things can be really important. Yes, I I would like to echo that and also add that something that might be useful to your organization is also just having like an inclusivity statement along with like a land acknowledgement on your website. So that like right from the get-go, when somebody is considering your program, they're seeing right away that it's like a safe space for them to express their identity or just be who they are. Um, and that, that the organization is taking under consideration these issues. Yeah. 
That's really helpful. Thank you, RJ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thanks for asking that question, Andy. Um, we were kind of hoping to get to that, but um, yes. Does anybody else have experiences that they want to share along those lines? I can share an experience, um, not not with a queer, well, kind of a queer rite of passage ish thing. Um, yeah. I used to work at a summer camp before I got into nature connection work that uh, was like kind of a hippy dippy summer camp that was part of the Omega Institute at the time. And they had like a boys and a girls weekend that were separate gender segregated events. And then um, there was a trans counselor who came um, probably like eight years into that program running and created a third option. And there were lots of kids that wanted to join in on that. Um, and then, uh, and then there was safe space for all three. Um, however, here comes the issue again of like putting the onus upon that one person who occupies that one marginal identity. When it gets to be too much, they can leave <laughs> and then they left. Um, and so, and then the program kind of fell on its face and it just became Boys and Girls Day again. And then it actually got to be less safe and weirder because then sometimes kids would say that they wanted to opt out or into the boys program and they would like a girl, for example, somebody who didn't actually identify with a male gender and it got really complicated and weird and there was spying and like other kind of awkward teenage stuff. Um, so I think having as a starting point, both on your intake form and your website um, and your questionnaire, like these kinds of disclaimers or inclusivity statements is a good starting point. And then making sure that you're hiring accordingly is the other part of that that's really important. Um, and even if it's not like your general staff, at least like having a consultant, but I think it, it needs to get to the point of general staff too in, in this day and age, <laughs> personally. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we had another point here along these lines, which is about parent education. So like if seeing an inclusivity statement like this on your website or seeing questions like this on your intake forms is getting weird with your parent populations, um, then you can offer a parent education night where you go over a lot of the resources that we've shared with you and that you found in your own research so that they can get comfy with the idea of sending their kid to a program where there's openness to, to this, doing this kind of work. Um, so that you know, like the parents know bef at the get-go that there are queer and trans folks in the community. And so that they can start the self-education process around learning what it means, how to educate your kid, not to relate to other kids like a bigot. And like, that's really kind of what it comes down to at a certain point, right? Which is, I think very seldom is that intentional on the part of children. They're mostly just echoing what they hear in their homes. So I just wanna be mindful that we have two minutes left or really a minute left. Um, and um, first of all, I wanna thank everyone for joining. Yes. Um, this is really just the start of this conversation in our community. Um, and so uh, as much as we can continue to educate each other and ourselves um, as we can, uh, I think is really important in this time. Um, as we continue working on decolonizing nature based work and um, making our safe spaces more safe and inclusive. Um, I wanna, I just wanna, um, I just wanna pose that this just be the, the start of, of a greater conversation. It's five o'clock. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so thank you, thanks for, for being a part of this. Yeah, thank you so much. 
And does anyone have anything that's like super pressing, don't want to leave without saying something? I'm also happy to stick around for like 15 minutes if people need to chat more. Uh, yes. Thank you two so much for doing this. Really, seriously, a lot. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank big you. thank you, Mishka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you thank so you. much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You're really, really good at the pronouns. Gosh. I'm going to end the recording right now. Okay. <laughs> if you don't want to stick around, feel free. Thank you, Simon and Saskia, too. Yeah.